afternoon everybody hi it's tim again here at seagate wines and today we are going to do our first of our great variety special editions um, and today we want to focus on the principal red grape of spain and that is called tempranillo uh, not tempranillo it is tempranillo okay uh, just as a little pronunciation issue um, so let's get started right away. We'll start with a little bit of, uh, of the history, okay? So uh, Tempranillo is, it, re it really is the principal um, grape of Spain, and it's pretty much, it, it outgrows everything else, probably four to one. Um, so this grape is grown principally in the um, Iberian Peninsula, so uh, mostly Spain, Portugal, where it's known by uh, a couple of different names, Aragonés or Tintorores, um, which is used a lot of times in port. Uh, but it's also grown all over the world, in Australia, in um, Paraguay, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, uh, and the United States. Um, it is the fourth largest um, amount of, of, of any variety grown anywhere in the world, um, with 87% of that total being grown inside of Spain itself. Um, so a little bit about the grape itself. It's, uh, it's kind of a black, it's a black skin grape, so super dark, um, very, very deep, deep color. Uh, it makes full body, full bodied red wines, specifically very, very dry um, red wines. Um, the name comes from the Spanish uh, temprano, meaning early, because it is an early ripening grape. It usually ripens several weeks before other grape varieties throughout Spain. So they harvest Tempranillo first, and then they harvest everything else after that. Um, it has been grown in Spain, in, in Iberian Peninsula, since before the Phoenician settlements, um, you know, talking hundreds and hundreds of years BC. Um, it is the main grape known in the most famous of all Tempranillos, the wines of Rioja. Uh, as most people know, they think of Rioja as a grape, but it is not. It is actually a region and it is broken down into three other regions. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but mostly it is it is almost always, uh, almost always, not always, but almost always 100% Tempranillo grape. Um, the other big famous uh, region, which is our favorite, um, would be Ribeiro de Duero. Uh, and the Ribeiro de Duero is, is, in 2012, was named the greatest red wine region in the world by Wine Enthusiast Magazine. It is super, 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 super high quality product coming out of that area. And we, we really enjoy those wines. Um, they, they range from very accessible in value up to, you know, the, the crown prince of, of Tempranillo being Vega Sicilia, um, which can be over 300 euro a bottle. So um, lots of different, um, lots of different ranges in there that you can get to. Um, both Rioja and Ribera del Nuero, they have aging requirements that give them the different stages of the names on the labels. And I'm gonna walk through that in a minute as well. So a little bit uh, of the history again. Um, so Tem Tempranillo was originally thought to be part of the uh, family from the Pinot Noir grape. Um, but according to legend, um, you know, it came in with the Cisterian monks uh, using their Pinot Noir cuttings that they had brought from uh, their pil pilgrimage to the Santiago de Compostela. Um, but the reality is when you go back and you actually do a DNA study of them, there is no genetic connection between the two of them. Spanish cultivation of Vitis vinifera, which is the common ancestor of all vines in existence today, um, starting with the Phoenician settlements in the southern provinces. So later, according to um, Colomela, which was, a, he was a very famous Roman um, writer of history. So he, he basically dictated everything um, down into books that we've gone back over the years and you can figure out what had happened in that time. Um, most of these grapes were grown all over every region of Spain, but there was only scattered references at that time to the name Tempranillo. Um, but Ribera del Duero itself, winemaking in that region extends back more than 2000 years. Um, there is a 66 meter high mosaic of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, 
that they unearthed in an archaeological dig in 1972 at the Baños de Valorados. Um, so you can actually go back and see this stuff. It's really quite amazing. Um, we believe that it was, it was introduced into the Western Hemisphere by Spanish conquistadors in the 17th century, um, as certain of the Creole varieties in Argentina uh, have closer genetic relationship to Tempranillo than to the small handful of European varieties, um, which you know they tested against all these Creole um, varieties, the Creola being the base uh, origin grape from Argentina and Chile. Um, so it is a bit of a fragile, a fragile grape, but it has traveled pretty much all around the world now having been, um, you know, put in pretty much every wine growing region on the planet. Um, so talk about uh, viticulture for a second. So the Tempranillo is, it's, it is a thick skinned grape, very, very dark black skinned grape. Um, growing best at relatively high altitudes. So you get very cool nights and very warm days. Um, it to tolerates a warmer climate, which is why it does so well in Spain, being an extremely warm climate. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the thought process is um, that in order to get elegance and acidity out of Tempranillo, you need cool climates, but to get higher sugar level, then you need the th and the thick skins that you need to give that color, you need heat. In Spain, those two opposites are best reconciled in the continental climate, but high altitude in Ribeiro del Duero, which is why it is believed that it is the best region for Tempranillo in Spain. Um, the average July temperature in Ribeiro del Duero is, is around 21.4 Celsius or 70.5 Fahrenheit, though the temperatures in the middle of the day in the lower valley can get as high as 40 Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, they have dramatic diurnal temperature variation, so temperatures can drop as much as 16 degrees or 30 degrees Fahrenheit um, from whatever that daytime high was. So you can go from over 100 degrees down to 70 degrees at night, which is amazing for the grapes. Um, Tempranillo is one of the best grapes in the world at adapting and thriving through these uh, continental Mediterranean climates like that. Um, pests and disease are a very, very serious problem for the grape since it has really re little resistance to either. Uh, so the grape does tend to form compact, tiny cylindrical bunches of spherical blue-black fruit with colorless pulp. The leaves are very large um, and they have five overlapping lobes. So that's a little bit, a little bit basics on, on the actual grape itself and the vines. Um, the wines themselves, they tend to be very ruby red in color. Um, aromas and flavors tend to include berries, plum, tobacco, vanilla, leather, herbs, things like tobacco, vanilla, and leather. They tend to, that tends to come from more of the wine making than the grape itself as those tend to be oak flavors. Um, Usually Tempranillo is at least 90% of any blend that's being done in Spain. There are a few exceptions, obviously, um, but it's usually bottled as a single varietal. Um, it's usually blended, if it's going to be blended, with Grenache, the French version, or Garnacha in Spain. Uh, Carignan is a French version known as Mazuela in Spain. Um, and my personal favorite, Graciano. Um, and then they also use in smaller variations in certain places, um, like in Navarra, for example, we have a wine that is, is blended with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and they're also using Merlot as well in some of the blends. Um, blending with Carignan makes it brighter and more acidic. So that's the Mazuelo, which is what you will find if you are gonna get a blend out of Rioja. It tends to be with Mazuelo. Um, other different blends will give you different profiles. Um, the Graciano will make it darker, richer, and more depth, uh, less acidic, less fruity, more intense. Uh, Tempranillo is the major component of typical Rioja, um, and it will always be at least 90 to 100% of Ribera del Duero. Uh, in Australia, Tempranillo, they blend with everything. So it's blended with Grenache and Shiraz, also known as Syrah in France, Portugal, they, it's known as Tinto Roriz and is the major grape in the production of port. There you go, a little bit of something, something. Um, Spain grows 80% of the, 87% of the world's Tempranium, and it is the most planted grape with over 201,000 hectares 
uh, grown in 2015, according, accounting for about 42% of all grape plantings. Um, it's surpassed, it's surpassed only by the white grape Arin. Tempranillo is native to Northern Spain, uh, widely cultivated as far south as Andalusia. Um, and we are, we're super, uh, familiar with Andalusia. We spend a lot of time there every year and it is very hot. So if you're going to have a wine that's being made using Tempranillo in Andalusia, then it tends to be done as a fortified style, something like the Malaga, um, uh, it's never really going to be one of your favorite table wines just because it's so hot that it over ripens and, and you end up with either high alcohol and uh, jammy fruit instead of fresh fruit. Um, it's, a, it's a very different, very different animal. Um, two major regions that grow Tempranillo. Um, obviously we've discussed Rioja and Romero del Duero. Um, but there are substantial quantities grown in Penedès, which is in Catalonia, just above uh, Barcelona. Um, also Navarra, which is a very, very warm desert area, and the Valdepeños, um, which is also in Catalonia. Uh, the grape is a major role player in the production of wines in Portugal, uh, Central Alta Alentejo. I don't know how to say these words. And, and obviously the Duro. Uh, Duro is very, some very, very famous wines. Um, I actually think I have a box of, there it is there, uh, Quinto de Valado right behind me is, they also know as T Torrigo Nacional, blended with uh, Tintororis. So let's talk about wines. All right. So let's go to Rioja. Um, Rioja is a do uh that is it's in the very far north of spain um they tend to have uh grapes that uh based mostly in tempranillo but as we've already discussed there are a couple of other options that you're going to have um but there are three regions that are in uh in rioja and one of them has actually just changed its name. So, you know, we've got to stay on top of these things. The three main regions of uh, Rioja are Rioja Alta, which is obviously the top, um, Rioja Alvesa, which is the smallest one, and Rioja Baja, which is the bottom area, which was the largest area, which has now changed its name. Um, it's now Rioja Oriental. Um, don't ask me why they did that. Um, Sometimes table wines from Rioja will be a blend of all three regions, um, but single varietal uh, or small production houses, they usually have very uh, location specific terroir driven wines. So it'll be from one single region in that area. Um, again, you know, super long history of wines being made in, uh, in Rioja and you have to sort of break these 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 regions down into their smaller regions because they they get uh, because of their altitudes and soil types you get very different flavor profiles out of each one. Starting with Rioja Alta, um, for us it's really where all the most famous of of, um, of the wines coming out of Rioja are from, um, as far as the high end producers. Uh, so. It's on the western edge of the region and has very high elevation in the other areas. Um, Rioja Alta is known for more of its old world style, so definitely terroir driven, very earthy, um, almost like a funky, dirty kind of a thing going on. Um, and it's very quintessential of Rioja from that area. Higher elevation equates to shorter growing season, which in turn produces more bright fruit flavor. Um, and the white, the wines tend to be a little bit lighter on the palate. They're delicate and flavored and flowery and really interesting. Uh, Alavesa, um, it has a similar climate to the Alta region, um, but the Alavesa tends to produce wines with fuller body and higher acidity. Uh, vineyards in the area have low vine density with large spacing in between their rows compared to the others. Um, and it's because they have very poor soil, soil conditions with vines needing more distance from each other and less competition so that they actually can grow. And then Rioja Oriental, which used to be Rioja Baja, 
Um, unlike the more continental climate of Alta and Alvesa, Oriental is strongly influenced by a Mediterranean climate, which makes the area the warmest and the driest in Rioja. In summer months, the drought can be a significant viticultural hazard, through, though since the late 1990s, irrigation has now been permitted in the region, where before, by law, it was not allowed that you could irrigate your wines. Um, temperature in the summer typically will reach 35 degrees Celsius or about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is extraordinarily dry as you are in the middle of the desert. Um, a number of the vineyards are actually located near to Navarra, which is probably the hottest of the, the good wine growing regions of Spain. Uh, but the wine produced from those grapes does be belong in the Rioja Appalachian. We have a wine that is from this uh, Appalachian um, that is uh, the Lagar de Bornos uh, Rioja that is on our portfolio. And you can tell it is very similar to the wines that are coming out of Navarra. Um, unlike a typical pale Rioja, the wines from Oriental tend to be very, very deeply colored, um, high in alcohol, obviously, because it is hotter and, and you have more sugar in the ripening process. Sugar has to be converted into either car, um, alcohol or uh, or you end up leaving it sweet. So in order to have produce these dry wines, you have reached in this region wines of up to 18% alcohol by volume. And they tip, typically don't have very much acidity um, and their aroma tends to be a little bit muted as well, but they're generally used as blending components with wines from other part of, of Rioja. So Oriental is where you're going to find the most blending of the Tempranillo with other grape varieties. So the grape varieties in Rioja that you are allowed to put in your wine, obviously Tempranillo is the biggest one, um, Mitrara Tinta, um, which is an individual, it is a indigenous red variety, um, but also Tem Tempranillo being the biggest one, Garnacha, Mazuelo, which is Carignan, um, and Graciano. White varieties are also grown in Rioja, uh, Viura, which in the um, Catalonia area is known as Macabeo. Actually, yes, correct. Macabeo, Catalonia, Viura, other, other spots in Spain. And also Grenache, Garnacha Blanca or, or uh, Grenache Blanc, um, which is the white version of Grenache. Um, so that's kind of the, the vibe there on on your Rioja wines. Um, in Rioja, you tend to have about 35,000 hectares of Tempranillo being grown um, out of a total of 40,000 hectares of red wine vines. Uh, 35,000 of that is Tempranillo. Um, and let's move to Ribera del Duero. So we're big fans of Ribera del Duero. Um, it's located in the Northern Plateau area. It's one of 11 quality wine regions in the autonomous community of Castilla, Castile and Lyon. That's a much larger area um, that has multiple regions inside it, sub-regions inside it. Um, it's also one of the several recognized wine producing regions to be found along the Duero River. That's Ribeiro de Duero. Uh, so Ribeiro is the valley, Duero is the river. Um, region is characterized by a largely flat, rocky terrain uh, centered around the town of Orlando del Duero. Although the most famous vineyards in Ribeiro del Duero are, are near Penefial and Roa del Duero. Uh, to the west, where the regional regulatory council, uh, Consejo Regulador, for the, for the denomination is actually located. Ribeiro del Duero, as I said earlier, was the wine region of the year in 2000. Well, wine here has been produced for thousands of years, but viticulture, as we know, probably arrived um, with the Benedictine monks that came in from Cluny in the Burgundy region of France in the 12th century. Uh, Ribera del Duero winemaking, um, as we talked about earlier, was uh, definitely there more than 2,000 years ago because we found in, in the unearthing of the mosaic of Bacchus that it was timed around the Roman Emperor, uh, Empire era. Uh, the Dio of Rivero do Duero was founded in 1982. 
uh, by an organization of wine producers and growers who are determined to promote the quality of their wine and enforce a regulatory standard. So basically, as we've talked about in all of our videos, the DO is a way for all of these people to get together and create consistency so that you can uh, end up selling better wine more consistently, get better pricing for your wines, and the world tends to take notice when they know that they can get a consistent product constantly. The geography of this area, so Roberto Duero, uh, it's located um, in the no elevated northern plateau area of the I Iberian Peninsula, so very, very far north and a very flat level, but at about 900 meters above sea level. Um, the, uh, it occupies the southern plain province of Burgos um, and extends west to Valladolid and parts of Segovia and Soria provinces to the south and to the east, respectively. Um, as its name suggests, the region follows the course of the Duero River for 115 kilometers upstream from Valladolid, and it is around 35 kilometers at its widest point. Um, the region located around the younger stretches of the river, uh, which later passed through the nearby Toro and Reira regions before traversing famous Portuguese growing areas of Duero and Porto where they get port from, and then it drains into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, geologically, tertiary sediment consisting of gently uh, lenticular layers of uh, silt and clay sand, alternating layers of limestone with marl and chalk. Uh, so the Dura Valley uh, was formed for the, for a, during the Miocene period. It has a flat, rocky, gentle, undulating terrain, ranging from 911 meters uh, above sea level down to 750 meters above sea level. Um, so you do have very high elevation everywhere, uh, but based on its slope and uh, facing towards the river, its uh, distance from the river and its uh, orientation towards the sun will give you better results for each different vineyard. Um, Moderately low rainfall, about 450 millimeters per year, um, and exposed to quite an extreme climatic, so a lot of extreme climactic conditions. Long dry summers, temperatures up, up to 40 C, are followed by very, very hard winters, which the temperature can come close to below freezing temperatures. In fact, speaking with some of our friends in that area, they have seen temperatures as low as minus 10. Um, there are also marked variations in temperature within each season. The climate is continental and Mediterranean, so there's more than 2,400 hours of annual sunlight. So the vineyards occupy about 120 kilometers square of, uh, of that region, and uh, most of which are situated inside the province of Burgos. Um, five kilometers square are situated inside the Valladolid province, and six kilometers square in Soria. Um, so the, the local name for this grape Tempranillo in this region will be called uh, Tinto Fino. It is the dominant red variety for the northern half of all of Spain. Tinto Fino is often but not always complemented with Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec and Merlot. Although the famous, famous Tinto Pasquera grown by Alejandro Fernandez in Pasquero de Duero is a 100% Tempranillo varietal wine. Introduction of Pasquero's 100% Tintofino was at the time very controversial as a considered benchmark Vega Cecilia usually blend Tintofino with Merlot, Cab and Malbec. They're using the French style in order to try and give themselves a little bit more uh, at the time, which was quite a long time ago now that Vega Cecilia um, became a big winery. It, it, for them, it was a way to be recognized internationally by using French grapes. The authorized grapes to be used in this region are Temper Tinto Fino, which is Tempranillo, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Merlot, and Garnacha. There is only one white grape that is allowed to be used, and it's almost always for the local consumption, um, you know, in little small cafes and bars, um, and it's called Albio, A-L-B-I-L-L-O. All right, so you've got more than 300 wineries in the DO, I mean, some you've heard of, some you've never heard of. Um, we'll go through a couple of our favorites right here. Um, we're talking about production. They do have 
Some of these wineries are making extraordinary wines in large quantities. Most are small producers. But what you do have is you have the aging requirements. So aging requirements are how you get your name. So let's see. So for example, let's pull out a Crianza. So this is from our friends at Resalte, uh, Bodega Resalte de Penafiel. So this is right next door to Vega Sicilia, um, just about three kilometers from the town of Penifia, uh, which if you watched our, our introduction to Spain video, you'll know that that's where the castle, the Castillo de Penafiel is located on the top of a small little mountain uh, mound in the middle of the city that and everything else circles around it. And that castle has been turned into the wine museum of Spain. And on the labels here at Resulta, you can see this cool, funky little precipice of the um, of the castle itself. That is their logo, is the castle. Um, so this is a Crianza. Crianza in Ribera del Duero, uh, which is similar to Rioja, must spend at least 12 months in barrel, okay? Reserve uh, wines must be at least three years old, but at least 12 months of that has to be in oak. That is, that is up to the winemaker. Um, so uh, Crianza has to be at least two years old with one year of that being in oak. And then Grand Reserva must be at least five years old and at least two years of that must be spent in oak. Um, here is a Grand Reserva. This was just released. This is the 2010 vintage, 100% Tempranillo. Um, all of the vines for the Grand Reserva from Resulte are over 100 years old. Okay, that's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. Um, all of the, the malolactic fermentation and its aging were done in new oak barrels from France. Um, this wine spent 36 months in, uh, in oak and 36 months in the bottle before it is released. And I can show you how they age the bottles in the racks before they actually put it out. Um, reserve wines. So here's a reserve wine. Uh, this is called Expression by Resalte. This version, this is the 2011, almost impossible to get now. This was named the best red wine in the world by Decanter Magazine in 2016. This wine spent, um, these are a little bit younger. These are at least 60 year old vines, okay? And uh, 100, again, 100% 100 Tempranillo. 26 days of fermentation uh, with its malolactic happening inside of oak barrels. This is 18 months in new oak barrels um, and then two and a half years spent in the bottle before it is released. Okay, so you're getting some really cool, um, really cool value out of these wines because they're pre-aging them for you. They don't release them until they're ready for you. So that's pretty impressive. Um, on the opposite side of that, this is a Tempranillo, 100% Tempranillo from the Toro region. Um, and these wines are gonna be a lot fresher, a lot lighter. Um, they're done in a young wine style. So it's, you know, gonna have flavors of cherry and black currant, raspberry, very floral. Um, so it's not, uh, this is not spend a lot of time in oak. It's, it's giving you more of the flavors of the grape and less of the flavors of the winemaking. Um, so you have, you have a lot of options. There's also two other uh, aging requirements that we haven't talked about here. Uh, one is called Roble, uh, which is at least uh, one year of age with three to, uh, anywhere from three to six months in oak. And then you have Jovan, uh, J-O-V-E-N, which can either be oaked or non-oaked. And it, at most, it cannot have more than three months of oak. And it is basically released the same year that it's produced. Jovan meaning young in Spanish. So hopefully you guys have, have got a little bit of uh, new knowledge about the Tempranillo grape. It is a very, very flexible and adaptable grape. And, and we have a lot of wine um, that we, we ha uh, have on our portfolio that focus on the Tempranillo grape and, and it's incredible value simply because of its pre-aging requirements. But don't be surprised, some of those younger wines 
um, like our, our uh, Leco Roble right now is showing incredibly well. This is a, a wine from 2016 vintage that normally is drank very, very young, but we opened a bottle of it recently in the last week or so. And the depth of character of this wine was shocking. It was amazing how good this wine was and how much it continued to uh, evolve over the course of drinking this bottle, which is not something that you normally get from a young wine like that. So you're looking at some really extraordinary winemaking coming out of Ribera del Duero, especially from our friends at Resolte. So if you're interested in trying something new, you like dry red wines, you like big dry red wines, or even some fruit driven dry red wines, let us know. We can walk you through some of these and you can pick them up at any time. So thanks for tuning in with me today. I hope you learned something about Tempranillo. I'm gonna start doing a little more of these great variety videos and walk you through some of the more unknown varieties that you may not have heard of or know a lot, a lot about. So it makes you a little bit more comfortable when you're choosing some wines out of the Seagate portfolio. So thanks for joining us and I will see you again next time. Cheers.